I'm Leah Lane, an award-winning travel writer and author of Places I Remember, Tales, Truths, Delights from 100 Countries. On this podcast, we share conversations with travelers about fascinating destinations and memorable experiences around the world. On Places I Remember, we love travel and travel stories, and our guest today has a memorable one. Sandra Smith's memoir, Out of the Fog, describes how marital discord, alcoholism, and recovery led her to a mostly solo seven-year sailing adventure in the Pacific. At 43, she buys a 35-foot sailboat, gets rid of the radar system and all the fancy navigating equipment, and teaches herself to sail. Navigating by the ancient mariner's system of dead reckoning, Sandra experiences horrendous storms, evades drug dealers and pirates as she sails over 4,000 miles alone and sometimes with her rebellious teenage daughter. Her odyssey brings self-discovery and healing. Welcome, Sandra Smith, to Places I Remember. Thank you, Leo. I'm thrilled to be here with you. Well, before we talk about your incredible sailing adventures, let's talk a bit about your earlier life. In your book, you write that you went to school in Scotland, you spent a summer in Greece, you studied in France, you hitchhiked to Barcelona, you lived in a villa with a friend in Aix-en-Provence with no indoor water and only a wood-burning stove, you sailed to the Canary Islands on a banana boat, and you met your husband there, and you married in Philadelphia, had two children, and eventually got divorced. Along the way, give us a brief idea of some of your occupations. Oh, gosh. I've had a lot of them. Let's see. I've been director of the Springfield Regional Arts Council, and I was cultural affairs that's in Missouri. And then I was cultural affairs specialist for the county of Santa Cruz in California, and then director of the Santa Cruz County Arts Council. I've been a chef at a restaurant in the harbor in Santa Cruz because I told him he was losing money not having breakfast. So he opened up and I had never been a chef before. Oh, it was awful. It was hard (laughs) because the young chef dudes gave me all the hard work. So I finally told him that's enough. But I became an expert on doing all the fish. Oh, I owned my own real estate and insurance agency in Philadelphia in the 60s when I I was very young. It was my husband, that husband, number one, had um, inherited it from his father, but he was not good at. Well, you were also an opera singer, weren't you? Oh, yeah. Well, that's oh, when yeah. I, <laughs> by the way, actually, they the opera, Philadelphia Opera Company found that in a head on collision, somebody hit me that my my vocal cord had been semi paralyzed because all of a sudden I wasn't able to sing. But the directors of the operas loved my acting. So I was always cast as a character, like the lead, the little French maid to the leading lady. Oh, yeah. The the number one prostitute. Or, you know, I was also (laughs) I was also the cafe owner in in, um, La Boheme. Then I was also in a lot of theater. I've been in a lot of theater all my life. Well, you've had a fabulous life in so many ways. But what made you buy a sailboat off the California coast? Well, my mother was paralyzed in a botched surgery, paralyzed permanently from the waist down. And she was very independent from Scotland, of course. And she insisted on living, staying living alone. She was a widow in her beautiful home in, outside Santa Cruz. And I was in Philadelphia. But I even got a housekeeper and she wouldn't ha- use her. So, But she kept falling out of her wheelchair, breaking legs. So after the seventh broken leg, even though she kept saying, don't move here on my account all the time. And I would say, if you say that one more time, I'm going to have that engraved on your tombstone. But anyway, <laughs> so I it was a choice of either staying in Philadelphia close to my kids. Who, there was a shared custody arrangement and they were now teenagers or moving to California again and taking care of mother. And I asked the universe and God and everybody in the universe said, mother. So I moved to mother, but I I didn't want to live with her because she used to push all my buttons in favor of my twin brother. So I said to her, you know, I'm moving here not to take care of you, but to improve the quality of your life. But I know you're very independent and I don't want you to feel like I'm, you know, moving right in. So I thought I'd buy a sailboat and live on it in the Santa Cruz Harbor and be real close to you. 
So what was the most difficult aspect of learning to sail and sailing? Oh, gosh, I made the mistake. There's I call them dock birds. It's boats that men with wearing white pants never take their boat out. They use them for a little, you know, to have little trysts with martinis, etc. And so I, when I bought the boat, I promised it, I'll ne- you'll never be a dock bird. I'll take you out every day. And even though I didn't know how to sail yet, and then I realized, oh, my gosh, if I don't keep that promise, the boat might not save my life when I needed it to. So every day, and it was December, and Monterey Bay is very fierce in the winter. Every day, I had to take that boat out. And that was the hardest thing. I was terrified. And I would go out and go around in circles with my eyes closed and hope that it would, we wouldn't die, you know. But that was the hardest part. Just Did you, you know, do it going, by yourself or did yeah, people teach no, you? No, really? I did it by myself. Wow. Now, I know you had some memorable crew. I read your book. Some of them were very, very good and some of them were very, yeah. very bad. Can you tell us about a few of the, both of them, good oh, and God. bad? Oh, gosh. Well, when my mother died and I asked God what to do, he said, it's time to go out in the big blue. But I was, I had gone up and down California coast learning how to sail the thing, but oh, out in the big blue. So I thought, well, maybe I'll get some crew to help me. And in the boating world, people offer to be crew as volunteers. You don't pay them, but you supply all the food and, you know, any, any other little extras. So I found two women that one had worked for a yacht broker and the other just wanted to go sailing. And uh, it turned out to be a disaster because that second one, she delayed our departure by two weeks because she had to have a tummy tuck for showing up for, you know, swimsuit time. (laughs) For the seagulls, yeah. Oh, gosh. And then she, she finally arrived and... She had all the the long nails, I call them claws. And I thought, how is she going to pull the ropes up with those claws? But anyway, we took off. You have to go around Point Sur, which is very scary. And I hadn't even been around it ever myself. And they stayed below. They wouldn't come up the whole time. And I needed to check the chart to see where, where we are. And they wouldn't come up. And they wouldn't take the steering, the wheel or anything. Oh, my goodness. And they just it just got worse and worse. And I finally had to. My, my daughter came out, my teenage daughter. And I said, what should I do? And she said, those two are so nasty. <laughs> <laughs> well, it worked out. You got you got you got to the yeah. harbor and you got you know on your way again i know you sailed for 7 years and you were heading directly down the pacific ocean hugging the coastline from san francisco tell us about some of your favorite harbors in and around mexico you mentioned the san benitos islands in your book tell us oh, about them. yes my daughter came out to sail with me as crew and so we she we it was i had gotten to san diego and so one of the boaters told me, who was really a nice boater, said, Sandra, if you have time, go out to the San Benitos because there's an elephant seal population out there. Well, I didn't know how hard this would be, but I had taught myself how to navigate with the compass and the chart. I didn't have fancy equipment. And so I made a course and everything and we took off. And so we thought we should be there, you know, in two or three days. But there was supposed to be a lighthouse in the lighted buoy there and when we arrived in the middle of the night where we thought we would be at the islands there was no lighthouse and got on the radio help anybody out there and a fisherman in broken english said watch out i see the light on top of your mast and you're heading right to go over our reefs and i said where's the lighthouse and he said oh it died years ago oh no (laughs) So he guided us in all around the three islands to get the safe way into the anchorage. Oh, no, another reef. It was like that for an hour or so. But we got there and got to see these fabulous elephant seals. What about an island that's near Cabo, near Cabo San Lucas in the in uh, the Sea of Cortez called the Spiritu Santo? It's called the oh, Jewel of the Sea of Cortez. Tell us about that pretty island. Oh, golly. There's... At that time, there, in fact, San Benitos, there wasn't anything on there at all, no buildings at all. Now I understand they have cruise ships going over there. But Espiritu Santo is 23 miles off La Paz, which is the most fabulous place to be in the whole of Baja. What, make, what makes it so fabulous? Oh, so much culture, so many art events. Oh, there, They even have symphonies there. 
So Espiritu Santo, you go from La Paz over there for the day or can anchor over there. And the, oh, the, the rocks there and the formations are incredible. And the, the plant life, the cactus, they're just gorgeous. And the little bays, little anchorages, the water is so blue and it's so peaceful there. It's a very beautiful thing to see the desert come down to the sea. It's a very stark and beautiful landscape. I I agree with you. Now you continued over to mainland Mexico and you went to anchor in Puerto Vallarta. You went to Mazatlan, Manzanillo, and many uninhabited places. What were some of your favorites of those? Oh, there's a little island off Puerto Vallarta that was always fun to go sailing over. Or sometimes when I didn't want to pull anchor, I'd just hitch a ride with a fisherman and go over there. And we all called it the Pie Island because there were only a few people living there. And the ladies that lived there, the locals, they made fresh pies every day and they'd walk up and down the beach each day. It was a different pie that you could buy or take back with you to your boat and PV. That was a lot of fun. I think I remember reading it was mango pie. Was that one? Yeah, that was. Oh, my goodness. Yum. (laughs) I would like that part. Well, after that, you, you got lost at sea trying to get to Costa Rica. Could you tell us a little bit about that saga? Uh, you talked about crew. That was another bad crew. Well, I was on PV and trying to decide if I should go south because it was kind of scary. For Puerto me. Vallarta, yeah. Yeah. And so this fellow there, he he needed crew. He was going to go to Costa Rica. And so I thought, oh, that's good. I'll get a chance to see what it's like sailing down there and if I can handle it myself. And he had leather patches on his jacket and had graduated from Stanford. So I thought he can't be all that bad. So I said, I'll, because I had stopped drinking years before, I said, I'll be happy to do it if you don't take any booze and I can bring my dog. And he said, yes, he agreed to that. And the next day, another fellow appeared that wanted to go on the trip. And he he's a cinematographer for the the largest movie company in Canada. And when he didn't have movies to do, he would just come down there and hang out. And so I called him Bear. He was kind of cuddly and big, you know, and really nice. So we took off and a few minutes out of the harbor, the owner, I'm going to call him Captain Bly, said, get me a beer. I said, beer. And Bear opened up the refrigerator. And I had donated all this filet mignon that I had driven to San Diego just to get because the Mexican meat is so tough to chew. And I donated this whole thing. And there wasn't, he had gotten rid of it and the whole rice box was filled with beer. And Bear went to get a glass to pour and the guy shouted down, don't bother with a glass, just bring me the quart bottle. (laughs) <laughs> and I knew I was in trouble and it went downhill from there. So you were supposed to be there about a week or so, but you ended up being lost at sea without much food and I guess weeks uh, on this yeah. trip, right? Without a compass and and sort of having to work it yourself with, with your own charts. Is that correct? You were kind of well, leading the way? We, yeah, well, we almost were a few hours out and his engine died. And I just read in my Bible, the Annapolis Book of Sailing, how to fix what was wrong. And he didn't want any woman messing with his engine. So we were off without an engine. And then not too far down the line, the jib got the main front sail, got a little rip in it. And he didn't have any sail repair tape. I mean, that's you go with that everywhere. And so he took that. So now we're down to just going on the the mainsail. And when I didn't see him navigating the charts, and I'm really good at that. And I said, I'd like to navigate the charts today. I'm good at it. And he said, I'm doing the chart. When I said, well, can I look at them and see where we are? Because I used to look every two hours and find where I was. He said, I didn't bother wasting money on charts. He said, I said, what are you using? He held up a book, National Geographic Atlas. And I knew we were in trouble. (laughs) Oh, my goodness. And it took weeks. It took weeks. Well, you, got, you got back from that one, too. But one thing you wrote about on the way there, you, you found this beautiful island. Wasn't there a lovely island in that area? Oh, yes. We went by Cocos Island. And it's where Robert Louis Stevenson, he wrote his book, Treasure Island, because they're pretty sure there's over a billion dollars worth of treasure hidden there by the fellow who took when um, Peru was having a going to have a war with Argentina invading the head of the church asked him 
this guy to take all the treasures, including a full-size solid gold Madonna and diamonds and pearl, all everything, to take it to safety. Well, the guy turned into a, a really naughty man, and he grabbed took all the stuff and instead of taking it where the guy said he took it to Cocos Island and they say buried it there. Well, it's still there probably, right? Yeah. Someone and also the, the author of Jurassic Park used Cocos Island as a model for Jurassic Park movie. Interesting. Well, you write that you lost a lot of weight for the lack of food while you were there, but you eventually wound up in Antigua, Guatemala, which is a beautiful landlocked area. It is not on the water. And when you were there, you were only supposed to spend a weekend. What happened? Well, I was, you know, after being lost at sea for so long and being a hostage because another boat offered to take me and he wouldn't let me get off. I was really in the low, low space. And Bear and I traveled around Costa Rica, but he was also, it was terrible. So I finally said, well, I'm going to guess I'll have to fly back to my boat up in Mexico. So I was at the airport. I got a reservation to get up to Mexico to get my boat. And these ladies behind me were talking about this place, Antigua in Guatemala. And it sounded so wonderful. They said, oh, there's artists everywhere. So I quick ran up to the desk and changed my ticket and um, flew to Guatemala City to go to this Antigua. And I got a ticket that I would go there today, Friday, and leave Sunday and go up to Mexico City. Well, when I got there, the U.S. government hands Americans three single-space typewritten pages. It says, guidelines for U.S. travel in Guatemala. And all three pages is, don't do this. Don't go climbing the volcanoes, blah, blah, blah. Don't care, go, blah, blah. And I scratched that out because I said, I'll never know Guatemala if I follow this rule. And I changed guide lines to guide book. And uh-huh. I promised Guatemala, you know, in my heart that I would not leave until I had done everything on the three pages. And so how long me, did it take? It took me six months. Oh my goodness. <laughs> you did it. You yeah. did it. I'm so proud of you. Anyway, my well, daughter said, my daughter even came down and climbed some vo- a volcano with me, and we were getting so exhausted. I saw a man with a white horse collecting wood, and I ran up to him. Can I borrow you a horse, please? I'm tired. And he said, Sure. And he let <laughs> us. We both r- rode off on a white horse to the top of the volcano. Oh, that's a beautiful image. Well, people can read in the book your other adventures, but you wound up in Eureka Springs, Arkansas, owning a and b and now you are happily married and landlocked in Bisbee, Arizona. How's that going? Oh, it's all wonderful. I finally sold the boat after another bad crew experience. One guy admitted he was a murderer, and that, that did it. <laughs> oh, so I, oh, it was awful. So I sailed my boat back again to Puerto Vallarta and I got on the radio. Anybody can help me sail up to San Diego. And a guy came on and said he could, could go as far as the Baja, right? And when he came on my boat, he looked it all over and he said, do you want to sell your boat? And I said, sold. <laughs> and somebody in, in that Puerto Vallarta was going to Arkansas and she I asked her, can I ride with you? Because these two other guys from Missouri told me I should move to Eureka Springs because there's people like me there, they said. So it's a very artsy and fun area, I will say. It's a lovely town. So that's how I ended up there. And when one of the times when the boat was almost going to sink, my whole life passed before me. And I saw the time when I was really single mom poor and I rented out my bedroom, you know, overnight and I had the best time with everybody. And that came across the screen when my life was flashing by. And I thought, OK, I'm going to move to Eureka Springs and open a B&B. So you did I, that? I, I ran it for 26 years. Wow. I think yeah. I probably have passed, as I said, I've been in Eureka Springs and I used to write guidebooks about b and So I may have been in your B&B for all I know. We oh, may, wow. may have met. Yeah, <laughs> wow. we could have passed her in the night. So let me just ask you, Sandra, the name of the podcast is Places I Remember. You have so many memories, but can you tell me one special one to you of all your travels? Gosh, you know... It, the, the landscapes can change and be beautiful or different, but it's people, the people you meet traveling that makes all the difference. And it makes me really angry when you hear people with their hatred and their prejudice. 
It's the people you meet. And so when I was, tra I traveled all around the Greek islands, you know, I met so many wonderful people on the Greek islands, not the touristy places, but the locals. And I always stayed away from tourist places because I wanted to know the real people. So in Greece, it was wonderful. It was also wonderful, the fishermen that I met in the different anchorages. You know, going down the coast of the Baja, it turned out each fisherman would call ahead to the next fisherman south to say, watch out for the pink boat, she might need help. They pass the message like that. And when I got one time, the motor died and everything, and I got to Man Manzanillo for the nearest mechanic, and it took days to sail there. All of a sudden, I I, I docked my boat in the marina. Here comes a running man. Sorrenta. They always call you by your boat name. Sorrenta, Sorrenta. I mechanico. I waiting for three days. You see how wonderful they are. Yeah, I agree. The people are what makes travel the best. I agree. Yeah. Thank you, Sandra Smith. The name of your award-winning book is Out of the Fog. And we have links in this episode's show notes. You show us that we're capable of amazing rewards when we open our minds and take some risks. And we all have stories to tell, whether or not we solo on the high seas. So thank you. Keep on going. Landlocked, not landlocked. I know you'll have a wonderful adventure coming up soon, wherever you are, because that's who you are. Oh, thank you very much, Leah. You're, you're a wonderful person to help everybody find neat places to travel to. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for listening to our award-winning podcast. We've recorded over 100 episodes of Places I Remember. So follow us on any podcast app. And new monthly episodes are also on YouTube with gorgeous video. My book, Places I Remember, is available in print and Kindle, and I read the audio version. Follow my travel writing at Forbes.com. Contact me at the links in the show notes or on my website, placesiremembrelealane.com, and keep making your own travel memories.